Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the organisers for inviting me to talk in the symposium today. I hope that wasn't just because I organised the meeting last year. If so, it would be a bad precedent to set. So, the um, title has changed somewhat of my talk. I'm going to have to spend a little bit of time talking about modern methane seed communities to put the fossil examples in context. I'm, I doubt that many of you know the, a lot of the details about how modern methane seeds work, so I need to spend a bit of time looking at that. And then I'll talk about some of the paleoecological interactions that we can find in the fossil record of seats and end with a few conclusions. Now, methane seats and associated communities were only discovered in 1984 off Florida. Over here, uh, they are marked in blue squares here. And uh, for the younger members of audience, then 1984 might seem like ancient history, but of course, it wasn't actually that long ago. And since then, people have found that methane seeps and associated communities around the edges of pretty much all of the world's continents. Now, this is a compilation in 2005, and actually, if we were to do that compilation now, we'd find many, many more blue squares all around the edges of the continents. So they're very, very common features, and they're found from the intertidal zone down to beyond seven kilometers water depth, and they occur where there is thick sequences of organic rich sediment. And that organic material is broken down by biogenic and thermogenic, methane, thermogenic processes to produce hydrocarbons, including methane, which then seep up onto the seafloor at discrete sites. And these are the sorts of phenomena, sort of things that you see at modern methane seeps. If the flux is very high, then you'll see vigorous outflowing of bubbles from the seafloor, and these bubbles include methane and carbon dioxide. If the temperature is cold enough and the water pressure is great enough due to water depth, in the subsurface, you actually find methane ice. These are the famous methane hydrates or clathrates. On the surface of the sediment at methane seeps, you will find microbial mats very commonly. Uh, these are the giant sulfide oxidizing bacterium Begiatoa in this case. And there are also specialized communities of animals which will form the basis of a, what, a lot of what I'm going to talk about in a minute. Another feature of modern methane seeps is very rapid precipitation in the subsurface of orthogenic carbonate minerals. So here we see some which have actually been collected uh, using the arm of a submersible. But quite often they get exhumed onto the sea floor. And when they're exhumed onto the sea floor, they can uh, serve as hard substrate for attachment of organisms where in general there is a lot of muddy sea floor. So there is a, a lot of hard substrate at methane seeps, uh, including these methane carbonates. At the heart of the methane seep community is a biogeochemical process called the anaerobic oxidation of methane, or AOM. And this is performed by a syntrophic consortium of methanotrophic archaea, and these are red in this fluorescent in situ hybridization image here, notice the scale, and surrounded by a coating of sulfate reducing bacteria, which are green on this fish image. Now, this AOM reaction occurs in the shallow subsurface where upwelling methane-rich fluids interact with sulfate, which is coming from seawater. So they occur in the redox zone. And this is the biogeochemical process here. Methane is oxidized by the methanotrophic archaea, and that's linked to sulfate reduction by the sulfate reducing bacteria. Byproducts of this reaction include hydrogen sulfide, which then gets enriched in the pore fluids at methane seeps, and also bicarbonate ions. And they link with, car with um, calcium from seawater, and that is why you get very rapid precipitation of these carbonate minerals in the shallow subsurface. Now, these carbonates have very negative carbon isotope signatures. They're enriched in carbon-12, and the reason for that is that the carbon is actually coming from methane, which is very fractionated. 
Right, the animals which dominate modern methane seep communities are those which have symbiotic relationships with either sulfide oxidizing bacteria or methanotrophic bacteria. So they include these things here, these are vestimentiferin tube worms belonging to the polychaete family Cybiglinidae, all of which have sulfide oxidizing bacterial symbionts in their tissues. They're, they, they're entirely reliant on sulfide oxidizing symbionts. They have no mouth or gut or anus at all as adults. It includes these visicomide bivalves, all of which have sulfide oxidizing bacteria in their gills. It includes bathymodiolin mussels over here, some species of which have sulfide oxidizers, some have methanotrophic symbionts, and some have both. So they're quite clever in the way that they can utilize a variety of different reduced compounds in these seed communities. Now, because of lots of sediment at methane seed sites, there are a number of informal bivalves with symbionts, and that includes leucinids, thiocerids and solomide bivalves, all of which have sulfide oxidizing symbionts. Now, you can consider all of these animals here as functionally being like corals in coral reefs. But of course, in coral reefs, the symbionts are phototrophic algae, whereas in this environment, the symbionts are all chemosynthetic, so they're, reducing, they're using reduced compounds as their energy source. Now, while the greatest diversity, sorry, the greatest biomass in seep communities occurs with these symbiotic species, the greatest species richness is amongst the smaller animals, particularly the primary and secondary consumers, and that includes things like these little limpets, which move around scraping or grazing microbial mats off the shells of mollusks and on, on the exposed carbonates. And it includes detritivores, like this little um, ophiroid here. And because there is a lot of hard substrate available in methane seep sites, that includes the shells of mollusks and tube worm tubes and also exposed seep carbonate, there's also a lot of habitat for sessile attached animals to live as well. So, for example, you can see these mussel shells here have got lots of serpulids on them. And this is a stylastrine coral attached onto some exhumed seat carbonate. Now, as always, where there are animals to eat, there are animals to eat them. So there are a lot of predators, the top level of these food webs. And that includes things like shrimps here. It includes crabs. And there's an octopus. Right, so now let's talk about ancient seep sites and see if we can see some of these ecological interactions in those sorts of habitats. So we are getting a lot better at recognizing ancient methane seep sites. We have several thousand occurrences these days. The record is good in the Cenozoic. It's getting better in the Mesozoic, but unfortunately still pretty poor in the Paleozoic, where we only have about 10 examples for reasons which aren't entirely apparent, probably because we haven't been looking hard enough. They are recognized as being fossil-rich carbonates with complex internal carbonate cements with very negative carbon isotope signatures for the reasons I explained earlier on. And they're often found in deep water siliciclastic rock sequences. And because of that, they often project out of the landscape. So here are some examples from, from New Zealand with some sheep on top of them. And here's me in Svalbard with a lump of seep carbonate within a deep water siliciclastic sequence. So in ancient seep communities, we can find examples of microbial micro fossils. So here we have an example from the, an Oligocene site in Washington State, and what we're looking at here are thin sections of orthogenic carbonate minerals. In this case, these are aragonites. And here we have two different morphologies of filaments. So there are some small skinny ones here, which are a few microns in diameter and several hundred microns in length. And then much larger ones here, which are a couple of hundred microns in diameter and millimeters in length. And some of these large ones here have sheaths around them. So these look like 
filaments within sheaths. And these could be equivalent to the giant sulfide oxidizing bacteria you find at modern seeps. But of course, a lot of the problem with this sort of evidence, and I'm sure most of you know this quite well, is it's very difficult to assign taxonomy and particularly physiology to these sorts of filamentous microfossils. So actually, we don't really know what these things were doing, or indeed if they were interacting together at all. But there's another completely different sort of evidence, sort of data, that we can get much better information from, and those are from biomarkers or molecular fossils. So those of you who have come across biomarkers before will know this, but there are refractory compounds which are found in the cell membranes of many organisms which make it into the geological record which are indicative of particular groups of animals. Or, in fact, in this case, uh, microbial um, organisms. So we have found in modern seed carbonates that there are biomarkers which are indicative of methanotrophic archaea. And these are the isoprenoids PMI, I don't know, I can't remember exactly what that stands for, biphytane, crocetane, and biphytanic acids. And then also there are biomarkers for sulfate-reducing bacteria as well, so very terminally branched fatty acids, particularly iso and anti-iso carbon-14 fatty acids. So what we're looking at here are gas chromatograph images from a Maastrichtian seep site, they're actually from Seymour Island, Liz, so they're from the, just a little bit lower down from the data that you were talking about, where we have seeps from Antarctica. And for some of these compounds here, we have compound-specific carbon isotope values as well. So you extract these compounds and stick them in the mass spec, and you actually get the carbon isotopic signature for them. So this is an example where we have many of those biomarkers this is the hydrocarbon fraction, so this is the one that shows the isoprenoids, and this is the carboxylic acid fraction that shows some of these um, indicative biomarkers for sulfate-reducing bacteria. And the real smoking gun here that these were involved in the AOM reaction is that they have really negative carbon isotope signatures. It's not, I'm afraid it's not very easily readable, but that PMI Signature there is minus 83, and in other ancient seed carbonates, we have values going beyond minus 100, and that can only come through methane, using methane. So we have biomarkers for the AOM reaction going back into the Carboniferous. We have a very good record of those sorts of microbial interactions going back into the geological past. Now, what about... Chemosymbiosis, that's very important in modern seep communities. Do we have evidence for that? Well, we need to step back a little bit here into modern ecology, and it's been established for quite a long period of time that you are what you eat in terms of the stable isotopes in your soft tissues, particularly in relation to carbon and in relation to nitrogen isotopes, nitrogen isotopes can tell you quite effectively where you are in trophic levels. So we've been doing a bit of work recently looking at the isotopic values of soft tissues of bivalves which are living in a variety of different sorts of habitats and which have different sorts of nutritional sources. So here we have some data for the soft tissues of some modern bivalves, both living in non seat sites and thiotrophic ones, so with sulfide oxidizing bacterial symbionts, not from seat sites, and then some thiotrophic examples from seats, and then ones with methanotrophs or dual symbionts. And you'll see that there's quite a nice differentiation in the carbon isotopic signature of the soft tissues of these animals. So that's all very well, but we don't have soft tissues in the fossil record. So what can this actually show? Well, as it turns out, there is data in the shells of these animals as well. So there is organic material in bivalve shells, which we lump together as SBOM, shell-bound organic material, which comprises structural proteins and other compounds which are found both between the crystallites of the shells, but also inside the crystals themselves. And I think you can see here there's actually quite a good correspondence between the isotopic values 
of the S-bond and the soft tissues of the animals themselves, particularly the ones which are using methane directly. So you can imagine that all we have to do is to get fossil shells and to extract the shell band organic material, look at the isotopic signature and bingo, we should be able to establish whether there is chemosymbiosis or not. Well, I'm not going to tell you anything more about that because one of our PhD students, Adina Papp, is going to talk about this on Tuesday at 11.15. Where's Adina? There she is, over there. So go along to Adina's talk and you'll get this part of the story there. Right, let's have a look at some animal-animal interactions in fossil methane communities. And we'll look at commensalism here. So those are organisms which are living together. So it's quite common to find limpets and other gastropods and also polychaete worms infesting these vestimentiferin tube worm tubes. It's a, it's a really quite attractive habitat for these animals. And part of this reason might be because there is a lot of epifauna growing on these tubes, things like microbial mats and also very small organisms, small animals. So these, here we've got an example from a modern seat community of a lot of these leopard, Lepita dryless specimens, which are living on the tubes and in many cases here also living on other Lepita dryless specimens. So you can imagine that as a limpet living on a cylindrical structure, there might be some problems there, because if you are living on a curved structure, then part of the underside of your mantle and perhaps some of your foot is going to be exposed to predators. And the way that limpets get around this is that they modify the aperture of the shell so that the anterior and posterior part of the shell have a curve in them and they have a central saddle on the side of the shell that means the aperture fits very nicely on a cylindrical worm tube worm. And we can see exactly the same sort of thing in the fossil record of seat sites. So we've got a couple of different examples here. So this is an example from the Miocene in New Zealand. And you can see in the anterior views of these Ceridonta specimens here, that curvature relates to modification of the aperture for sitting on vestimentiferin tubes. And you can see that in the side view as well of these things. And in fact, we even have some examples of limpets which are very closely associated with fossilized worm tubes here. Here's an, old, excuse me, here's an older example from a Cretaceous seat site in Japan. We actually have two different genera of limpets here. And again, you can see in the anterior margin of the shell this curvature formed by the animal sitting on top of these tubes during life. Now, in these two examples, we also have interactions of limpets with other gastropods as well. So here we have a limpet which is sitting on a Provana gastropod, and here we have a limpet which is sitting on a Vita gastropod shell. Now, it's just possible that these are post-mortem juxtapositions. I don't think so, mostly because it's a less exciting explanation. <coughs> Right, now this is something, another animal, animal commensal interaction which I talked about at Pallas a couple of years ago. And what we find in modern seed communities is that quite often attached onto vestimentiferin tubes are these things. And these things are cat shark egg capsules. So the female cat sharks are using these vestimentiferin tube worm clusters as a preferential site to lay their capsules presumably to avoid predation. And we can see just this same sort of interaction in the fossil record as well. So here we have some Eocene examples of cat shark egg capsules. And these examples here are very closely associated with the ends of tube worms. Now this is some material that I've been working on more recently from Miocene seats in New Zealand. There's a rather nice cat shark egg capsule. And what we have here is a transverse section through a vestimentiferin tube worm. Just notice the scale there. And then attached around that is a small tubular structure. And this is actually a tendril from the anterior portion of a cat shark egg capsule. So we have very close 
interaction here of the cat, bits of the cat shark egg capsules with vestimentiferin tube worms. We've got some older examples of this, of then they may not be cat shark egg capsules, but I'm pretty certain they are of elasmobranchs associated with Albion age seats, both from California and also from the high Canadian Arctic. So this association has been going on for quite a long period of time. Right, so uh, some other animal-animal interactions which may be commensual or could indicate parasitism is found in many bivalve shells from fossil seep sites. And these are bioimmuration traces. Here's an example of one on this very large extinct bivalve, thing called Caspiconca. And if you have a look at the posterior margin here, there is a wiggly line on the inside of the shell. Now this thing is not a later boring. This is something that was living between the mantle and the inner wall of the shell and causing an indentation, wiggly indentation in that shell. This is another example here. This is an internal mould of a lucinid bivalve from a slightly earlier Cretaceous site from Svalbard. And what's happened here is the shell has dissolved away and instead, uh, and what, what it's left is this bioimmeration trace on the inside of, that was actually on the inside of the shell, so same sort of position. Now, I've called this bioimmeration, but I realised that uh, relating to what uh, Paul was saying earlier on, that might not be the right word. What do you think, Paul? Bioimmeration the right word there, or bioclausation, or... Bioclastration. Clastration. I need to get the terminology right for the next talk. Right. Now, what organisms was, were causing this sort of interaction, we don't know. If you look at modern bivalve shells, they're often infested by polychaete worms, so particularly polynoid polychaetes. So here's an example of one here. But of course, what they're doing is they're living in the mantle cavity. They're not living between the mantle tissue and the inner wall of the shell. So we don't actually know what organisms were causing these sorts of ecological interactions, but they're actually quite common. Right, cottage industry. So let's look at uh, predation. So predation is very common uh, in these ancient sea communities. And that includes growth line disturbances that we often see on bivalves and gastropod shells that show non-lethal predation on these mollusks. And many of the Cenozoic examples show drill holes. So some of these drill holes are complete, some of them are incomplete, and we find them on pretty much all of the mollusks that are, that are in these communities. So here's an Eocene example from Japan, and we have drill holes in vesicamide bivalves. These are in thiocirids. These are some slightly younger ones from the Miocene in Japan, and here we have drill holes in thiocirids and leucinids and solomides and vesicamides. And in this case, we also have the organisms which were probably responsible for many of these drill holes. These are fossil naticid gastropods. Right, a few other interactions with substrates here. Um, here we've got, in thin sections, some serpulids. So we have a typical pattern of serpulids growing on other serpulids, which is very common thing that you find in, in uh, modern marine communities and, and it makes sense when there's very little hard substrate available that you grow on other circulated worms. This thing is a trace fossil called Podicnus from Miocene site in New Zealand and this Podicnus trace is actually on this part of this brachypod shell here and Podicnus is the mark made by the pedicle attachment of brachiopods. So in this case we have evidence for brachiopods attaching onto other brachiopods. And the final thing that I want to show is these micro-boring structures. So these are in thin sections again here. What you're looking at is bivalve shells with different sorts of morph morphology of borings in them. So these borings here may be caused by sponges or they may be caused by animals like barnacles or perhaps the perhaps uh, Fridians, different, different worms. Uh, 
Again, it's quite difficult to tie down the actual organisms which are responsible for these, but it is quite a common feature in these ancient seed communities. Okay. So, in these ancient seed communities, we have evidence for all sorts of interactions between microorganisms and between microorganisms and animals and between animals and animals themselves. So, we can reconstruct quite a lot of the trophic diversity that you see at modern seep sites in fossil examples as well. And I think part of that is because there's very rapid precipitation of these orthogenic carbonates, and it does freeze into place some of these interactions that you might not see in other marine communities. So there is, a, there is quite a lot of opportunity to develop this work, I think, at methane seep sites in the future. So I'll just... Uh, wrap up by saying thanks to past and present PhD students and many colleagues who, whose work I showed you just now and various funding agencies. And we're back on time. Thank you.